Dr. Ashwin, you can start. Good evening. On behalf of Raipur Obstetric Gynec Society, I welcome the Society of Fetal Medicine, Dr. Ashok Kurana, Dr. Bimal Sani, Dr. Ratna Puri, Dr. Ashish Pancha, Dr. TLN Praveen, Dr. Chinmay Rath, all of you to this program. And today we are going to learn of renal problems, you know, lower urinary tract obstruction. Now, this is something that if we are a little careful when we do our third trimester growth scans, we will see in a lot of people. And most of the time, we sort of get panicky that something is wrong. But today, we are going to learn about how we are going to diagnose it, why it happens, and what happens to it later. You know, is it really something that we have to worry about, which gets better and which does not? With this introduction, I invite Dr. Ashok Kurana, sir, to please take over. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's like I always say, it's a privilege to be in, in Raipur and to be amongst friends. And I'm so glad we already have a large number of participants in spite of the raging of COVID. I know it's very difficult and I do hope that good sense prevails and people take care and stay safe. Um, uh, today's topic is different. We're going to do a different topic. We're going to do it differently. And that's about urinary tract dilatation. And we will take you through several scenarios, four or five of them, and explain what happens during pregnancy, but purely from the point of view of the report that you receive if you are a practicing obstetrician, which means you received a report of a finding. It's not an exotic case. It's a daily case. Simple images that I'm going to show, nothing very special, but something that you encountered every day because you need to then handle it. This is a program is then designed accordingly. So I'm going to start my screen share and go right ahead with introducing uh, our panel. We have, as usual, a very distinguished panel. As you notice that for, for the collaboration we have with the Riper Ops and Gynae Society, we've really been taking topics that are of completely um, of complete relevance to the practicing obstetrician and to people who have a daily encounter with fetal medicine. So we'll talk about fetal urinary dilatation in an ultrasound report and what should be the ideal approach for a practicing obstetrician. We're not going to discuss the other component, which is to look at the renal parenchyma and decide whether there is cystic disease or not, but purely uh, the possibility of obstructive versus non-obstructive fetal urinary dilatation. We have uh, Dr. T.L.N. Praveen, our president here, Dr. Ratna Dwapuri, who actually needs no introduction. Uh, she is uh, uh, past president of the Society of Film Medicine at the Gangaram Hospital in New Delhi and our most popular uh, panelist and speaker that we've ever had uh, on our programs and the feedback that we've received. We have Dr. Bimal Sani, our uh, incoming president designate after this term gets over. And he, as you know, practices in Aurangabad and is a very, very popular teacher. And then we have Dr. Chinmay Rath, who again needs no introduction to Raipur or uh, to the country or the world for that matter. And she uh, has a field medicine practice in uh, Hyderabad. And uh, we look forward to a great interaction. I hope my arrow is showing and everything is showing well. Vishal, are we on? Yes, sir. Wonderful. And so let me start with our first case. We have an image like this in a report and it says in the conclusion that we have a unilateral six millimeter anterior posterior diameter of the renal pelvis. And this is the only finding in a scan at 19 weeks and the rest of the report is completely unremarkable. So my very first question and this question goes straight to Dr. Chinmayra. What does this mean? And what should the obstetrician look for in this report apart from this label? And what is the differential diagnosis? Good evening, sir. And uh, this says six millimeter dilatation of one of the renal pelvis at 19 weeks gestation. 
Now, uh, basically, in the 19 weeks period, we are doing a scan to rule out any major abnormalities in the fetus. And as you said, there's nothing else uh, given in the report apart from the six millimeter dilatation. The anterior posterior diameter of the fetal kidneys at the 19 to 20 week scan is expected to be less than four millimeters. So if it is more than four millimeter, we call it pelviectasis or dilatation of the renal pelvis. And whenever we see this, what is expected as the uh, person reporting the ultrasound is to also give a little more uh, detail as to how the kidney is otherwise looking whether there is any change in the corticomedullary differentiation pattern, whether there are cysts, as you have pointed out here, and whether this pelvis, the uh, diagnosis of this pelvic disease is accurate because you don't see anything else elsewhere. How is the bladder? Uh, are there any change in echogenicity of that kidney? And uh, can you see a dilated ureter? Is there a calicial dilatation also happening in the kidney? So you need to uh, mention all these things in the report. In addition to that, the obstetrician will also be interested in the amount of fluid around the uh, fetus because the kidneys mainly produce the um, fetal urine and uh, that contributes to amniotic fluid significantly at this stage of gestation. So we need to uh, comment on all these things. Thanks so much. And so would you then consider a report incomplete if it doesn't have all these details? Yes, sir. actually, because we, uh, when you're doing a fetal scan from the fetal medicine point of view, you need to provide as many uh, clinically relevant uh, data as can be. So all these things are important for the obstetrician to understand whether this particular finding needs a lot of uh, intervention at that point or some kind of change in the plan of the, uh, like there was a message right now in the group saying that we want ultrasound knowledge. We don't want the obstetric uh, inputs that much because we are more interested in ultrasound. But that's the whole thing about fetal medicine where the ultrasound contributes a great deal to the obstetric management. So at 19 weeks, six days, you need to put all that in the report so that the obstetrician can make sense of that report. Yes. And of course, as you know, the Society of Field Medicine has, um, has in, enough uh, programs for, for obstetricians, enough for uh, people in ultrasound, enough for people in genetics, and most importantly, what we always regard as completely sacrosanct, completely superior to everything else, working together as a team. So an ultrasound in isolation does not mean anything. And we've learned that. We've learned that it's of no benefit to the patient until all of us sit together and put our heads together and work with the patient. Uh, so I then take another perspective, and this is from Dr. Bimal Sani. Could you please repeat for us a list of what ideally we should be uh, looking for in such a report and including when we do a scan like this from an imaging point of view and how should such a report be concluded? Well, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, in this particular case, of course, it's a unilateral thing. Most important thing is point one is that we need to have the anterior posterior uh, diameter of the renal pelvis and that is the intrarenal part of the renal pelvis. Again, that's a very important thing which people usually do not uh, uh, bother to you know, uh, see. Even when they are reading the guidelines, they do tend to forget that it is the intrarenal part of the renal pelvis that we need to measure. And then having done that, the second important thing is whether there is a calectasis or not. Again, once there is the calectasis, whether it is central calectasis or there is a peripheral calectasis. The third important thing is to have a look at the parenchyma. And then that should also be, see, it's not only about the positive findings that we need to document. We also need to document the negative findings also. Like the, the, you know, the parenchymal appearance is normal. There's no increased cortical ecogenicity. There's no, uh, there are no cortical cysts present. So appearance is important. The thickness of the placenta, uh, parenchyma, whether there is a parenchymal thinning, that needs to come into uh, documentation. Then the ureter whether there is an associated hydrourator along with that. The bladder, in the sense the bladder, the shape of the uh, bladder becomes important. And then, uh, it, you know, it's always better that you do uh, during your scan, you should see the bladder has emptied uh, or reduced in size in between. That is an, an important thing which comes into picture. And of course, as you rightly pointed out in the previous, this thing also, Liker is also very, very important. And if you, when you're looking at the bladder, you look into uh, the thickness of the bladder wall. 
you know, the, whether the, you know, if you are finding that the bladder uh, wall is greater than three millimeter, then again, that becomes an important thing. Then whether there is a presence of a urethrocele down there. And uh, as I said, you know, do you, are you seeing any keyhole appearance, which is suggestive of a dilated proximal urethra? So all these things need to come as a part of your, uh, you know, the central part of your report. And when it comes to conclusion, and uh, of course, uh, you, you, anything which is related to the urinary tract, do look at the genitalia because somewhere down the line in your mind itself, you are going to, you know, that is something which may help you in coming to a more precise diagnosis. And as far as the conclusion of the report is concerned, I have a, a habit of uh, putting the findings again in the conclusion also, because uh, I would not uh, rather put just the grading or this thing because again, uh, we have such a vast variety uh, different types of grading. People still follow the mild, moderate and severe that we do, uh, you know, which we have been practicing for a very long time. But uh, I think the, we haven't been able to pass on the new classification yet uh, all over the country. So people still believe in mild, moderate and severe. There is one word which I would like to emphasize on, whenever you are writing about the negative findings, like there is no calyctesis or hydrourator, you, it cannot, there cannot be a full stop after that. It should be, there is no calyctesis or hydrourator at present or at this stage. That is again, something which needs to be uh, there because we all know that these things can evolve. So that one word is legally very, very important that at this stage, we are not finding anything else. And of course, along with that, we need to look at the other part of the anatomy and all those things will come in. And then I would say, okay, like in this case, I would say that there is a unilateral urinary tract dilatation and there is no calyctesis or uh, hydrourator at this stage. The parent comma appears normal. So this is UTD A classification A1. And I think uh, that becomes a substantial uh, report that you give. Excellent, Vimal. I really hope that everyone listening in is now giving reports like this because we've been working on this for the last two and a half years. And I'm so glad you pointed this out. And we now carry on this similar discussion with Dr. T.L. and Praveen. Uh, what is the guideline that we have for, about what Dr. Bimal just told us from the multidisciplinary co consensus on the classification of prenatal and postnatal urinary tract dilatation system on this finding? Uh, thank you, Ashok, and uh, I really congratulate uh, the Raipur team for organizing this fifth episode and uh, purely depending on ultrasound features. Uh, this is one of the most uh, interesting aspects of this particular episode. Now, today we are going to deal with one of the common uh, ultrasound features which we come across in our day-to-day -day practice, that is AP diameter of the renal pelvis being uh, so and so in the sense if it is six millimeters or eight millimeters or or 10 millimeters. Now, basically, since a long time, we have been following what is called as a fetal society of fetal urology classification, whereas Bimal said, it used to be mild, moderate, and severe. But then, as of now, with the multidisciplinary consensus statement that has been published, in which the Society of Maternal and Fetal Medicine has published this document, wherein they have stratified the antenatal features of a urinary tract dilatation, dilatation. Now, they have basically classified it antenatally based on the gestational age and the size of the AP renal pelvis diameter. If the gestational age is between 16 to 27 weeks of gestation, the AP renal pelvis diameter should not be uh, more than seven millimeters. And if it is more than 28 millimeter, 28 weeks of gestation, so obviously here, one point which we should remember is that even though you find a renal pelvis diameter, which is between four and seven, you would definitely like to reevaluate them at 28 weeks. That is in the third trimester. That is the importance of doing the third trimester scan, wherein if the renal pelvis diameter is between seven to 10 millimeters, you classify it as low risk low risk in the sense it is called as UTDA. A doesn't, is mean, it means only that it is an antenatal stratification or status, uh, uh, risk stratification. Now, if the, uh, just, uh, maybe if the renal pelvis diameter is more than seven, between 16 and 27 weeks of gestation, 
And if it is more than 10 between, uh, I mean, after 28 weeks of gestation, obviously we know that we are dealing with uh, a, a higher risk stratification that is UTD A2, A3. Not only that, when we are trying to classify this uh, uh, renal pelvis diameter, we need to uh, consider various other aspects which Dr. Bimal as well as Dr. Chinmay has told us regarding the calicial dilatation, regarding the renal parenchymal thickness, regarding the renal parenchymal echogenicity, ureteric dilatation, status of the bladder, and the amniotic fluid. If you consider them in A1, that is low risk stratification, where we have the renal pelvis less than seven in 16 to 27, less than 10 between 28, more than 28 weeks, we need to look for the calicial dilatation. Most important thing is when you are looking for the calicial dilatation, you need to classify the calicial dilatation into a central calicial dilatation and a peripheral dilat calicial dilatation. What does this mean? The central calicial dilatation is nothing, nothing but the major calyx, that is the, the infundibulum that communicates the peripheral calyx with the renal pelvis. If that is dilated, then you call it a central dilatation. If the peripheral calyx, which is at the, that is the end point, if that is dilated, you call it as peripheral calicial dilatation. Whereas in A1, we only have a central calicial dilatation, but not the peripheral calicial dilatation. And rest all, that is the renal parenchyma as well as the ureters and bladder are absolutely normal. And there is no oligohydramnias. Whereas if you take the A2 and A3 risk, that is the higher risk, uh, uh, higher risk, in that what we have is not only the central, but also you find that there will be peripheral calicial dilatation. Along with it, there are changes regarding the renal parenchyma thickness, echotexture, uh, dilatation of the ureters, as well as abnormal bladder in sense either a grossly distended bladder or a trabaculated bladder, at the same time unexplained or oligohydramia. This is not what, where we are going to stop. We need to follow them up into the postnatal period because postnatal uh, risk stratification is also an extremely important factor which we have to, because in my question, it has been stated that we need to talk about the postnatal urinary tract dilatation. What we need to do is basically we need to carry it on into the postnatal period. This is, this is actually the Society of Fetal, uh, Fetal Urology. And next, in postnatal, we have classified it as P1, P2, and P3. P1 is the postnatal stratification. P2 is, that is P1 is actually the, 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 the milder variety or, a, or a, a low risk, whereas P2 is intermediate risk and P3 is high risk, wherein again, you take the renal pelvis diameter and remember, always you need to advise a postnatal scan only after 48 hours. Why so? The reason is that after 48 hours, before 48 hours, the, the, the neonate will be dehydrated. That is the reason why you may uh, 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 underestimate the, the calicial dilatation. That is the reason why we need to do it only after 48 hours. And based on the renal pelvis diameter, again, you need to think about various other aspects also. And depending on that, you stratify them as P1, P2, and P3. I think this is what- Come back to that in a few minutes, because I want a little more on that. But tell me, why did we uh, abandon the Society of Fetal Urology uh, classification? The Americans still like us to use it. Some of our Indian urologists, pediatric urologists still like us to use it. I know, I know. The reason is that uh, we have been tuned to using this Society of Fetal Urology classification quite often for a very long time. But then the reason why this has been over, uh, I mean, uh, the Society of uh, Maternal and Fetal Medicine has push, uh, put forward this uh, multidisciplinary uh, consensus statement is that there, is, there was a lot of confusion between grade zero, one, and two. The reason is that there was no specificity regarding the amount of renal pelvis diameter dilatation, as well as the presence and absence of the the central as well as the peripheral calicial dilatation. Whereas in grade two, grade three, grade four, it was all right because it was, it, was, it was very obvious that we are going to deal with, but then the amount of importance that was given to the ureteric dilatation, the amount of uh, importance that was given to the renal parenchyma and the amount of importance given to the bladder was not really mentioned in the Society of Fetal Urology classification. That is the reason why over a period of time, the Society of uh, Maternal and Fetal Medicine uh, publication of multidisciplinary consensus statement has become much more practical and much more useful because 
the common clinical of the ultrasound feature which we are going to come across is what we are interested in and based on which only you need to risk stratify the condition so that is the reason why this has uh, been taken yeah. so we move on to our next question um, and and this is for dr ratna puri um, now what what about her genetic evaluation she's uh, basically a 4 year 7 month uh, primary with an uneventful pregnancy spontaneous conception low risk first trimester combined tests low risk preeclampsia screen and low risk nipt so thank you very much um, and it's a pleasure to be with everybody in raipur so just coming back to this case you see that she's a primary gravida and we would have taken a family history to make sure that nobody has some kind of a kidney problem or any sort of a genetic disorder and the uh, first trimester screen was done which shows a low risk and also an nipt is a low risk so the new guidelines uh, for aneuploidy screening say that once if you have done nipt that has a sensitivity of 99 to 99.5% for down syndrome in your level 2 ultrasound you really don't need to report soft markers okay because it sends the the little the lady and the family again into a frenzy because the sensitivity is so high even if you put in new likelihood ratios with that very very low risk of 1 in 20000 post nipt it is not going to increase the risk so that is very important um so that is the first thing that really i would like to say here so and in this specific case i would do no genetic evaluation at all because everything has already been done thank you and that's how the first trimester evaluation when it's done completely helps us out um, my next question is uh, um is again for you Uh, when we see these things in general, when we have an isolated pelvic tissues, uh, then do we understand that the risk of chromosomal abnormalities is low anyway, and um, the karyotyping would be considered only if there is an associated major structural abnormality? Yeah, and for the other so, disorders yeah, in the last uh, group, which are the non-chromosomal disorders, you would have associated yeah. anomalies. so you know once you find this at your 18 to 20 uh, week scan we've already heard dr bimal and uh, dr tln say that we are going to reassess at 28 weeks so there yes. if you've got massive dilatation you've got hydronephrosis if you've got bent femurs you've got other associated anomalies i would think of a syndrome associated with cacut and i think we'll come to that a little later so we'll elaborate yes. on that and um dr bimal sani if this patient had not had an nipt then how would you assess the risk for trisomy 21 after this 19 week scan her first trimester combined risk for trisomy 21 uh, was 1 in 1340 sir as an isolated finding of fetal hydronephrosis actually has a likelihood ratio which is very close to 1 so like you're showing in this chart and it becomes to 1.08 1.08 is the likelihood ratio so is actually not altering the uh, a priori risk now since she's already had an fts and the fts risk was 1 in 1340 so this is not getting altered so this would probably become 1 in uh, uh, 1300 or so so that is actually the same risk as it was before so if that risk was okay in the first trimester uh, you know not uh, warranting a uh, further testing then i there is nothing more that we need to do now because the risk is the same after that yes so so then uh, from a genetics point of view we'd be completely comfortable and from a follow up point of view we would still follow our risk stratification as we have already discussed now uh, dr tian pravin could you please list out the follow up plan which week and what observations okay right um, and i think uh, this is the second part of it i'm sorry i yeah. uh, i think okay now basically whenever we have uh, uh, on an antenatal scan we have uh, stratified the risk as a1 
the most important thing we need to understand is that we definitely need to do one more scan in the third trimester that is after 30 32 weeks of gestation that is one after the baby is born that is in the postnatal period we would like to do at least two that is one after 48 hours the other one after one to six months later now not only that we need to as uh, already it has been stated that we need to always keep in mind the possibility of aneuploidy but then with the present cl clinical scenario i don't think we need to bother about that but the basic uh, thing is this particular case which fits into utd a1 definitely requires at another scan at about 30 32 weeks of gestation then when in the postnatal period we would definitely like to uh, evaluate her after 48 hours or after one month. But then remember at this stage of uh, there, if suppose if the renal pelvis, which has been six millimeters in the 19 week scan, if it is regress, there is a possibility of 68% of them to regress and 13% uh, of them to uh, be static and almost 3% of them to become person. So if they are static or they are regressing, I think we, uh, the 32 week scan is more more than enough we may ask the patient to come, the neonate to come back after one month for a repeat postnatal evaluation of the renal pelvis. So this is what, as far as the A1 is concerned. But then if you have a, a, a fetus or an antenatal scan showing that there is a UTD A2 or A3 in that uh, situation, definitely we would like to follow them up closely. That is the reason why we would like to ask them to come back after four weeks. And that is after 19, that is about 23 to 24 weeks of gestation. And then one again at third, the third trimester, that is after 30 weeks of gestation. And positively, we need to evaluate these neonates after 48 hours as well as one month of age. And wherever it is required, particularly these are the patients where if, if we are suspecting some vesicouretic reflux, then depending on the specialist concern, then either a nephrologist or a, a pediatric urologist, we have to take it forward depending on the features that, are, that we are going to evaluate as far as the postnatal scan is concerned. So then, so we have very clear defined non-gray zones to handle this. And um, in terms of this decision-making uh, that we normally have, um, the um, assessment of amniotic fluid, what is the best way to assess that? Do we, um, do we measure it out as a maximum vertical pocket? Do we measure it as a, a four quadrant adapt? Or Quite does it, it is subjective, but then if you, you want a specific objectivity, objectivity then we, yes, uh, vertical pocket is one of the best ways of uh, assessing the amniotic fluid. Excellent. So subjective is often good enough. Now, Dr. Chinmayra, please reinforce this management plan from a practitioner's viewpoint. When should a pediatric surgeon step in? Two different questions. I think uh, in terms of the urinary tract dilatation, it's already been said, everything has all been said. And the first and foremost thing is to establish that the diagnosis is correct and that it is an isolated condition. And once it is isolated, how to uh, look at the extent of the problem and to uh, eliminate other structural problems and other um, markers for chromosomal abnormalities, looking at the screening perspective and making sure that we don't have anything else to worry about. For example, the patient had already had an NIPT, so we need not worry about chromosomal problems. If the patient had not had any screening and then presents to us with a, a six millimeter dilatation at 19 weeks, then it's a little different story. And at that point, we would approach it as we would approach any other case who has had no screening in the past and probably offer a quadruple test or a NIPT at that stage and then move on because it's not a very major marker. As we saw, the likelihood ratio of this uh, marker in an isolated condition is very low. From the structural point of view, kidney is a very important organ. The moment we talk about dilatation in the kidney, possible surgery, possible things, like Dr. Bimalsani said, we are not going to write, it's all, uh, there is no dilatation in the ureter. We'll write there is no dilatation in the ureter at present. And we will give them a follow-up plan that you will come back in the, in the third trimester. We will look at these things again. And still there might be dilatation at that point. So this will lead to a lot of anxiety in the parents. And therefore, it is important for us to reinforce, as you've asked me, to uh, reinforce the understanding that 
the dilatation may not always increase for a pathological reason. One of the commonest conditions when we see uh, minor urinary tract dilatations is because of a relaxant effect of the maternal hormones, which is a very, very physiological condition. And some women respond differently. They have a more prominent uh, response to that relaxation and their kidneys look a little more prominent as compared to others. So that's an important thing to say. Even in that condition, in the third trimester, the fetus is going to produce more urine than it was producing in the second trimester. And therefore, even if it is physiological, there could be a slight uh, enhancement in that dilatation. And it is important for us to mention that and explain it to the parents so that they don't get completely thrown off if it is eight millimeter in the uh, 32 weeks scan. So the plan will be at, at this moment to reassure them and tell them that when you come in the third trimester, we are going to look into it and then uh, see, suppose it becomes dramatic in the third trimester. And then we start really wondering that there could be a lower urinary tract obstruction. Probably that would be the time when you could suggest the pediatric surgeon's intervention, because it would be more realistic for us to expect that there might be his uh, requirement of his role in uh, the postnatal period. Uh, uh, practically, what we have seen is when we go overboard and send them to the pediatric surgeon at 19 weeks with a six millimeter dilatation, they come back with too much information and it's, it's like, the pediatric surgeon is also trying to justify that um, consultation and give them as much information as possible, but that may not really be what they really required and it ends up doing more harm than good at that stage. So giving them an idea, all of us know what it's going to be. So giving them an idea at that point and sending them to the pediatric surgeon when there is a realistically big dilatation, then it's useful. Some parents will be very, uh, very, very anxious and they will be unreasonably um, uh, like worried at that point. And then if it is required, then you, it's a good idea to intervene, uh, get the pediatric surgeon at that point. But then it will be a good idea to do a multidisciplinary counseling at the same sitting with the neonatologist, the pediatric surgeon, if possible, the fetal medicine specialist and the obstetrician at the same time. That would be an ideal situation to counsel such parents. And the follow-up plan will be look for the dilatation. If it does not increase, then excellent. If it increases, then we keep on following it up serially and make a newborn plan. And we've learned already that during the pandemic that uh, Zoom meetings are becoming easier and easier for everybody Absolutely. to get together. So that famous panel or the cancer board or the pediatric urology board doesn't need to exist. We just have a Zoom meeting with the patient where all of us can be then appropriately timed. I think this is one of the great things we've learned actually, that our counseling, multidisciplinary counseling is going to be a lot more uh, easier to do. Thank you for that wonderful input. And um, uh, th this is uh, what, what the surgeons would normally do. Uh, so Dr. T.L. Praveen, could you just summarize uh, yeah. what, what, uh, what this is? I just said that in the post period, because as I said, the fetal medicine specialist job doesn't stop with the antenatal uh, evaluation, but it uh, continues into the postnatal period, wherein you need to again uh, stratify the risk based on the low risk, intermediate risk, and the high risk. Again, basically, you first and foremost thing depend on the, the renal pelvis diameter. If the renal pelvis diameter is more than 10, uh, at, at about, uh, uh, yeah, then you call it as UTDP1. If it is between 10 and 15, uh, uh, you call it as UTDP2. And if it is more than 15, you call it as UTDP3. Now, the follow-ups also depends on the uh, postnatal risk stratification, which has been based on the postnatal 48-hour scan, wherein you would like to evaluate them. And if they fall into a low risk, again, you may, may ask them to come back after one to six months. If it forms into an intermediate risk, you may ask them to come a little earlier at about three months and if it is a P3, where it is a high risk status, uh, uh, situation, then you may ask them to come after one month. Now, the need for a lower urinary tract evaluation in the form of uh, vasicos uh, and uh, cystourethrograms are basically the discretion of the clinician. Now, th this is a one question that has been really bothering most of the radiologists who are associated with postnatal management of these fetuses or neonates is that when do we do a, 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 a vesico, I mean, a cystourethrograms? So basically, whenever you are suspecting a refluxing ureters, whenever you are suspecting that there is only a unilateral dilatation of the ureter, in those situations, definitely avoiding cystourethrogram is required. But then, basically, it is in consultation with pediatric nephrologist or the pediatric urologist. Now, antibiotics. 
as we all know the 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 uh, urinary tract dilatations are usually associated with high risk to urinary tract uh, infections and in that situation quite often most of the uh, clinicians or the pediatric nephrologist or pediatric urologist put them on a long term low low dose uh, antibiotics uh, but then this is also again depends on the discretion then there is one more thing that has come up very recently is that some of these uh, neonates have been subjected to circumcision which has definitely helped them and they have there were a possibility it was possible to wean them off from the low dose antibiotics also now the functional scan functional scan is to differentiate the functional status of both the kidneys that is if one kidney as you can see in this particular case where there was a 6 mm dilatation in case we presume that it has gone into utd p2 in that situation we need to evaluate the functional status of this particular abnormal or pathological kidney against the normal kidney and see how much of the renal function is preserved because based on that only the pediatric surgeon will take them over for surgical corrections thank you that's very beautifully summarized and let's move on to our next case this one was an uneventful it just resolved and there was no problem with it so we move on to our second most common finding and this is a patient who comes in for a 30 week growth scan a 25 year primary uh, clinically her uterus is less than dates that was the indication for this scan and let me just get back to that and then we say all right the scan findings are a right hydrourethronephrosis and a little tortuous ureter little dilated and um, normal growth normal doppler so the question that arises then dr bimal sani what should we include in an ultrasound report with this finding and a differential diagnosis please i know it sounds like a repetition but uh, we need to go through these four or five scenarios uh, very very cautiously yes sir uh, uh, yes definitely it is uh, see the checklist should not change very honestly speaking the checklist should remain the same uh, that you know we, uh, we, you know whether both the kidneys are present or not then uh, what is the location of the kidneys that is of there the size of the kidney also becomes important once now we are talking about a uh, hydronephrourethrosis then of course the size of the kidney again the ap diameter will be of the renal pelvis it will also become important again the presence of calyctesis you know all those things that we talked about in the previous case will also need to be documented along with that the of course the parenchyma i you know maybe in the first case 6 mm isolated it wasn't that uh, significant but when now here we already have an hydrourethral so parenchymal thickening parenchymal appearance uh, and reinforcing on those things all over again and then the urinary bladder and this is one place where it is also important that we uh, we can measure the diameter of the ureter also and uh, specifically because we once i talk about the differential diagnosis once we uh, keep the etiology in our mind then we can we also know that yes the certain things become important and of course whether there is a ureterocele i would also like to once i am seeing a hydrourethral i would also like to confirm whether it is a uh, duplex kidney also that also becomes an important thing so when we come to the etiology or the differential diagnosis uh, we can think in three uh, types you know one is an obstructive cause where there is an obstruction at the ureter ureterovesical that could be because of a ureteric stenosis or a ureteric stricture or the second cause could be a reflux cause where the vu reflux and that probably is one of the common uh, reasons that we get it and the third is a non obstructive non reflux where you know it is uh, the a part of the ureter becomes a uh, atonic where you know that's because of absence of so like what we talk about uh, the aplasia of the esophagus or then uh, we uh, th that is the thing the, the neurological aspect which takes place and that is one more reason where you can get it uh, 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 you know hydrourethral and then the congenital megalourethral that we talk about where uh, you have the dilatation of the ureter and in those cases you will find that the ureter is more dilated than the is and associated syndromes and that is what i said once you have a hydronephrourethrosis or a hydrourethronephrosis 
then yes, all these cloacal anomalies, pelvic masses, spoon belly syndrome, and of course, if it is bilateral or even if it is not bilateral at this moment, yes, we also need to rule out uh, luto, that is lower unit tract obstruction, like posterior urethral valves and uh, urethral atresia and all. But can it ever be transient or physiological? Something like the image that. Yes, you can, sir. You know, if you're seeing a peristalsis that at that transient moment, or physiological. You, just, you can get a transient uh, hydroureter. But uh, that's what I said. It's a complete picture that you need to have right from the pelvic calicial system to the ureter. And at times, of course, you can have a ureteric dilatation and no uh, pelvic calyctasis up also. Like uh, even with the VU reflux, things could initially, at the time you are scanning at that moment, it is the hydroureter, which is the one which actually could be the one which is suggesting that yes, uh, at this moment, uh, there may not be a significant uh, pelvic electrics higher up. Right. So, uh, Dr. Tilan Praveen, again, the guidelines, please, from the yeah. great consensus. Uh, basically, here we are uh, presented with a patient who has got a unilateral hydroureteronephrosis. Now, when we have this sort of a situation which is unilateral, basically in this situation, as the ureter is dilated, and as we could see in the images that you have projected that there was a, a, a central as well as the peripheral calicial dilatation, I would like to put this as a, a, UT, I mean, a UTD A2, A3. Even though the renal parenchyma looked normal, the renal parenchyma thickness was normal, bladder was fairly visualized, as well as the am amniotic fluid was adequate because you said that the growth and the doppers were normal. So basically, I find that the am amniotic fluid is normal. So we would like to place them as UTD A2 or A3. And no, more than A3, I would like to put it as A2, that is one. First and foremost thing. Second important thing is whenever we have a unilateral situation like this, the things that we need to look for is one, it could be because of a vesico ureteric junction obstruction. Two, it could be because of a ureteral seal which is intermittently obstructing. That is where you get this sort of a transient hydronecrosis. Uh, not because of uh, any uh, other situation, but because of that. Third important thing I would like to see the, the location of insertion of the ureter, whether it is your ureter is a, in an ectopic insertion or not. Then third, fourth one is I would like to look for the, the, the double moiety or the duplex system, wherein the upper moiety could have a hydronephrosis, hydroureter. And then the fourth most important is the uh, uh, megala ureter with uh, microcystic and uh, hypoperistalysis, intestinal hypoperistalysis. So these are all the things that we would like to consider whenever we have this sort of a uh, ultrasound feature which suggests to us. Now, uh, the same pay, pay baby, when it is delivered in the postnatal, again, we would like to evaluate them at the 48 hours, and then we need to evaluate them, and uh, probably we will place them as a UTD P2, that is the intermediate risk. Okay, now, uh, I think that's, that's what it, I could summarize about. Right. Thanks. Um, so Dr. Chinmay, and so, what do we do with so, this 30 weeker who comes in crying, There's something wrong with my baby's kidneys? No, I mean, uh, yes, uh, we have to tell them that um, this is the first time, I, I presume this is the first time we've seen the kidneys being dilated. Yeah. Because uh, the 19 week scan was normal and this was a routine growth scan on which this finding was found. So as always, I would uh, expect that the um, person reporting it has checked all other organs of the baby and made sure that everything else is uh, completely normal. And if this is an, and I would also like to re review what was the screening uh, done in this patient. And that is why it's important that you should have done our first trimester screenings well. We should have done and documented the TIFA scan well, so that by this time we, we are standing on firm ground telling them that, okay, we had ruled out your risk for aneuploidies and whatever could have been detected in the second trimester has been normal. It would be excellent to have a, picture of the kidney on the second trimester scan to show them that look at that point because one of the first reflex questions they asked us is why was this not seen earlier 
So as we have told them earlier that this could be a progressive condition. And if we have the pictures of the kidney uh, well documented in the mid trimester scan, that's a very good way of telling them that, look, at that point, this problem did not exist. And it is something which comes in progressively. So now it has come into the uh, picture. And if we are going to tell them it has progressed, like uh, Sir said just now, there could be a, a possibility of various uh, pathological conditions in the lower urinary tract which are contributing to this dilatation. And uh, probably at this point, I would then involve a pediatric uh, surgeon for the counseling of the patient if they are anxious, because maybe they will require some intervention after birth. So make sure that this is the only problem. Look at the screening history, counsel, and involve the multidisciplinary team. And how much time would this take for an obstetrician's appointment? Getting the obstetrician appointment is not a problem, sir. They'll run straight from the scan room to the obstetrician because they won't let her room, leave the room until she sees them. No, but do you, do you uh, recommend that the obstetrician should spend a certain amount of time on such a counseling session? Or, or should we just say, no, no, go to fetal medicine? At this point, I think obstetricians and fetal medicine have to work together and they have to spend time because there is no way around it. The, the only reason that uh, patients get anxious and there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, sort of... Uh, Bagatelling everywhere is because they don't uh, get satisfied with what they hear at one place. So whoever is doing the scan should summarize it properly and tell it to them. Now here, sir, I don't know why we have to have this distinction. A person who's doing the scan is a clinician and that person understands what he is doing. So it's not wrong for that person to uh, explain the scan report to that patient. And I think as obstetricians, there should not be that... Uh, a disgust about other persons explaining the scan report as long as the person knows what they are explaining. And then the, uh, whatever the obstetrician, obstetrician says, if they are speaking the same language and saying exactly the same things, then just like you've been highlighting here, there's only reinforcement that happens. Because if something is right, it is right. Whatever was the classification earlier, Sir said that again, and he said the very much the same things. It may be different ways of looking at it, but if it is right, it is right. So why should it be any different whether the obstetrician counsels or the fetal medicine person counsels? I, I think the times have changed in the sense, uh, initially the obstetricians used to get really upset. And uh, one of the senior most obstetrician told me, don't get into my shoes. And now the present uh, thinking is different. And then now people are really asking us to counsel them. I mean, whoever does the scan is supposed to be or responsible for telling them the features, the findings that they found, and most probable uh, explanation for those findings. The change, times have changed. And I, no you inputs know, on this, yeah. Uh, sir, if anyone who takes the responsibility of doing a scan should also take the responsibility of explaining in the most compassionate way possible the findings. And uh, yes, you have, you can always suggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, an opinion from a pediatric surgeon or a pediatric nephrologist where and when required, but primarily counseling has to be done by the person who has done the scans. That is very essential. And, and that is the way we should move forward. There's no question of just enumerating an odd finding here and there. You have to have a good report. And part of that good report is documenting uh, the entire counseling process and the other negative and positive features and a detailed counseling at the point of first contact of diagnosis. Wonderful. Now, this patient was then sent for a second opinion. And a second opinion study reveals a six millimeter, very close to the apex uh, ventricular uh, septal defect like you see here. And uh, so now we have a little more. Now, in this situation, um, Dr. Ratnapuri, genetics, please, the need for invasive procedure, if any, can we do these at 30 weeks and what should be done? You have to unmute yourself. So an isolated muscular VST really has not much relevance because most of them close spontaneously after delivery. So at least uh, I do not give too much cognizance to them. As long as you've done a good anatomy scan and you've made sure that other than the unilateral um, hydrourethronephrosis, there is no other abnormality. And if the screening is in place and it's low risk and there is no family history of any kind of a genetic disorder or 
a renal anomaly. I know genetic testing is indicated at 30 weeks. However, if for any reason, say there are associated anomalies, there's something happening there, then an, uh, um, the amniocentesis, the procedure can be done at 30 weeks. There is no law that tells us that we cannot do the procedure. You can do it even at 34 weeks. Just make sure that you've given your steroid doses for fetal lung maturation before that, just in the event of preterm labor because of the procedure. It's very, um, I've never seen it, but it's, it's safer to do that. And you can do the procedure and though you cannot do a karyotype after about 24 weeks of gestation, you can do the, the, the DNA-based tests. You know, you can do the QF-PCR, you could do the microarray, you could do the gene test, if it is indicated. It is not indicated in this situation, but we're just telling you that the procedure can be done. Thank you. That was crisp and clear. The, um, uh, the, the situation now we move on to is a third scenario. And this is a 26 weeks primary, 29 weeks pregnancy, uneventful pregnancy so far. She comes in at 26 weeks with decreased fetal movements. And she sent off an ultrasound to figure out why these are so. And we pick up a bilateral hydrourethroenephrosis. The kidneys otherwise look pretty neat and clean. The AP diameter of the renal pelvis on the right side was 11.1 millimeters. On the left side, 8.9. The ureters are between 3.1 and 3.3 millimeters wide. The urinary bladder is trabeculated. There's a post void large residue which goes down only by about 10% or so. And then not a very good focus at the lower end on whether there truly was a keyhole or not. The growth looks all right, the Doppler is okay, the rest of the anatomy review is perfect and the amniotic fluid is absolutely great. So now in this situation, uh, Dr. Vimulsani, let's start at the beginning. What are the anatomical norms for urinary tract measurements? Uh, this is for me, I think. Uh, oh, sorry, this is for you, yes, yes, yes. I yeah. think you <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice. Okay. Um, see, there are quite a few normograms that have been described in the literature. But then yeah. quite often, what we do is we go subjectively. Well, but then being subjective is not really required in the sense there are certain parameters which can be very easily identified in the sense. For example, the renal sizes are usually gestational age dependent. And they usually correspond to about two to two and a half vertebral body length. So when you take the the craniochordal diameter or the distance of the kidney, it should be about two to two and a half. And there are various uh, charts that are available, particularly published by Chitti et al., where they have said about, they have given a specific measurements for the kidney length, that is the uh, craniochordal length, AP diameter of the kidney, transverse diameter of the kidney, as well as the renal pelvis. Renal pelvis we have been uh, harping upon uh, from, the, from the first scenario onwards. So these are all the various things that are available. Now coming to the, uh, the ureters, when once the ureters are dilated, as it has been very clearly meant, because normal ureters are not seen, first and foremost. Thing. If at all, if you are seeing the ureter, that obviously means that there is a possibility that it could be a transient dilatation or it could be a pathological dilatation. If it is a pathological dilatation, it is always better to measure them because in the post follow-up cases, the follow-up scans, we would like to definitely compare with the amount of dilatation that has taken place or is it progressing? That is two. Three, whenever we take the bladder dimensions, the bladder dimensions particularly, it is very easy to remember this. Gestational age plus 12 is the upper limit of normal. Suppose, for example, we have an 18 weeker and the, just, uh, the, the, if it is plus 20, 12, that is in the second trimester, it should be not more than 30 millimeters. So that is one thing which is very easy to remember. So this is one point which I thought it is very important as far as the measurements of the urinary tract is concerned. Now, um, we move on to our, our next question. And, and this is on the uh, legal and the real world status of sex determination. Dr. Vemutsani, you mentioned that you always like to um, check this because it's so much a part of a urinary diagnosis. Yeah. So in the PCP and DT Act, 
Yes, I know you're going to tell us it's completely perfect. But tell us a little more. Sure. Uh, as far as, see, there are certain conditions where the sex of the fetus becomes important for us to make a, you know, a diagnosis like lower urinary tract obstruction, because one of the commonest you see, you're seeing, suppose you're seeing a keyhole appearance, you need to confirm, you know, because the posterior ethyl valve is common in the male. Now, legally, you can, even in the PCP NDT Act, yes, there are certain conditions where, which require you are supposed to. But, you know, I, I am uh, of a different opinion personally, because as I said before in one or two events also, whether you want, you would like to put it on paper and say this is posterior, because the, the moment you say this is posterior urethral valve, you are clearly saying that this is a male fetus. So again, uh, it, uh, uh, whether you should make a diagnosis of this kind, it also depends upon have a, you know, what is the understanding level prevalent in the city where you practice, the understanding level of the appropriate authorities. Uh, so this is because overall, if you look at the PCP and DD Act, the interpretation at different places has been different and uh, we have all been used to it. So it is better that I would not uh, make a broad statement here that uh, yes, you can legally so from tomorrow onwards. So these are two. And secondly, I also feel that, you know, uh, why not just call it as LUTO? Why not just call it as lower unit tract obstruction? Why do you want to specify this as posterior urethral valve? How is that going to change the management here? So it's better to play safe. You are anyway conveying what is required. Like it's the same goes with ovarian cyst also. Yeah, we call it as a pelvic cyst. Sometimes we call it as a gonadal cyst. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we are conveying the message, but without putting ourselves into danger. That is what I feel in real life scenario. But legally, I think, yes, there shouldn't be any problem in making a uh, precise diagnosis. Because Wonderful. even current studies have also shown that, you know, the keyhole appearance also is not, uh, you know, something which is most commonly because of posterior urethral valve, but not always. Yes. So let us keep it as lower urinary tract obstruction and uh, uh, be safe and be happy. Yes, true. Uh, the uh, next question, Dr. Chinmay, the prognostication, please. Can we retrospectively look for clues in the 11 to 14 week scan for this case of a bilateral hydrourethronephrosis with an obvious uh, lower urinary tract obstruction? Um, sir, at this point in time, I don't know, uh, the prognosis to me uh, looks like she will need some kind of surgical intervention after the delivery of the baby because the bladder is also showing some changes and uh, there is obviously post void residual urine, which means incomplete uh, bladder evacuation. Uh, the hydrourethro nephrosis per se is not that severe at this moment. I think that uh, dilatation is only central at this moment and not peripheral. Uh, so, in terms of this, I mean, we have to say guarded prognosis because there is, it is still only 29 weeks, if I am not wrong. And uh, the pregnancy has to go on till full term and uh, the uh, situation is progressive. But, but the good thing is there is enough liquor around the baby and till 29 weeks, if there's enough liquor around the baby, then at least the lung development would have happened normally. We don't anticipate any other postural uh, limb problems and things like that, which we get worried with. So um, there is a fair uh, possibility that things will be good. At, with a normal liquor, how it will help in um, checking the urinary um, Analytes, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to offer any kind of investigation or intervention at this stage. It will be wait and watch. Like Bimal sir said, I think it's important we just document our findings. If we see a keyhole, we see a keyhole. That's it. Now, what causes a keyhole? That is an academic discussion between people who read and re interpret. And if we have made a, a differential diagnosis of a possible posterior cell, well, there's nothing wrong because it's just a differential diagnosis. So uh, I think we CP entity cannot stop us in reporting this as to whatever we are seeing there. How it is interpreted, it is not a pathognomonic sign of posterior ethyl valve and that is not a pathognomonic uh, sign of anything else and there will be other kinds of states where there could be a posterior ethyl valve and the gonads itself may be mixed up. So that I think we can justify that in any which way. Whatever we see, we should report it. 
Wonderful. Now, we had this very interesting paper uh, from uh, Kate Bilada's group two years yeah. ago. Uh, I think that's what you were asking. Is there, there any yeah. uh, clues in the 11 to 14 week scan? Yes. And uh, that is what we would look for uh, the uh, longitudinal bladder diameter at the 11 to 14 week scan. If it is less than seven millimeter, it would have been normal at that stage. And there was no scope of even suspecting anything at that stage. But if it was more than 15 millimeter, probably we would have thought it was uh, obstruction. But that would have caught the eye of the operator, I'm hoping. Yes. If it was between seven and 15 is when you suspect more of non-obstructive uh, pathologies. And I think that's bringing you to this paper. So. Yes, and which is why I sort of said, okay, you get concerned if it's greater than 12 millimeters, and that might be a prognostic problem. And if there were any, if there was a thick entry and the presence of umbilical cord cysts. Now, we used to have a whole bunch of uh, tests we used to think of later in pregnancy of actually um, doing a visicosynthesis, puncturing the fetal urinary bladder and checking for urinary analytes, uh, tongue twisting names. They never caught on. One, of course, was there was old urine in the urinary bladder, as people used to say. What, what else? Why did they never catch on? Because so that really, as long as there was urine being produced by the uh, kidneys reaching the bladder, some degree of function was already preserved there. Yeah. And to uh, correlate that directly with the possibility of urinary dysfunction was difficult. If it's a bilateral affliction, whether both kidneys are afflicted in the same way or one of them is compensating in terms of the function, it's, it's difficult to predict. So the only way that could work is if the analytes are grossly deranged, then you could say that both the kidneys are bad and that would automatically uh, put you in a bad state to do any kind of intervention. Yeah. But yeah. if the kidneys were um, normal on their own, then we would not be able to tell whether one of the kidneys is affected or... Uh, I mean, how bad the situation is. And therefore that really, I mean, still it is recommended. It is still recommended before you're planning an intervention. But like you said, it is really not caught up that much. Yeah. Now, uh, can I interrupt? Yes, of course. The, the urinary bladder, that is urine sample, was uh, being done in order to uh, do certain interventional procedures. Uh, yes, sir. Particularly the vasicoamniotic shunts. But then a psychoamniotic shunt per se itself has got uh, got into bad repute because it was yeah. not stable. And <clears throat> most often uh, a big failure because the baby used to pull it out. Not only that, the, the registry has very clearly, the urology registry has very clearly specified now that uh, by assessing the uh, urinary uh, sodium chloride and uh, 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 all these analytes may not be really helpful in planning or in preparing ourselves for an interventional procedure because per se interventional now as it is whatever it is there it is only the petoscopic urethral valve fulguration in case if at all if you want to uh, plan for so that is the reason why this uh, urine sample analysis was not very uh, successful or very was not very much accepted yeah we'll come back to that again um, Dr. Ratnapuri, what is the need for genetic evaluation in this scenario? So here you have in the third trimester, um, a lower urinary tract obstruction for whatever reason. So the predominant thing in about five to 6% of cases, you could have chromosomal abnormalities. And I think we are okay just doing an aneuploidy test here. The reason to do it is that if there is some abnormality in the chromosomes, you can plan delivery accordingly. You give a little time to prepare for the parents because you know, otherwise everything takes them by surprise. So I would offer just a simple test. You don't need to do extensive tests because we're just dealing with a so-called posterior urethral valve. Yeah. Um, I have one question to you. Yeah. Do you always have to take the blood sample or can we use the urine sample to get the uh, aneuploid evaluation? Uh, do we always need to take an amniotic fluid, not a blood sample? No, 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 no amniotic fluid or is it uh, okay if we take the blood, uh, urine blood sample? It depends upon how many fetal cells they are in the urine. Sometimes if the urine is very dilute, you may not get enough DNA. It's all about that. So we definitely know, so you know, um, we definitely know that in the amniotic fluid, in addition to the fetal cells that come from the urine, they are also from the skin and the secretions and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
So if we get good enough DNA in the urine, you can do the test. And uh, then should we all agree that we should uh, then again look for all associated abnormalities to yes. make sure this is not similar? How much is possible, sir? Because with that kind of oligohydramnios, you may not yes. be able to see everything. Yes. And then, uh, Bimal, would you then mention it in your report that, that uh, visualization was limited? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Suboptimal evaluation due to uh, so suboptimal evaluation of anatomy due to oligohydramnios, and uh, at the same time that uh, or the visualized anatomy revealed one two three four five. That's all. Yeah, yeah. and uh, tell me uh, to make sure that the obstetrician picks up this point. Do you write it in your conclusion as well? Yes, sir. It yeah. comes. Uh, it comes as the first sentence in the conclusion, sir. Yeah. See, all limitations, uh, other than the declarations and uh, all those we have, but the limitations as far as uh, any suboptimal evaluation should be the first sentence that should come in your report, in your conclusion, sir. Very yeah. important thing. Because once you have said that, then yes, whatever else you are saying is in a scenario of suboptimal evaluation, sir. So yeah. the first thing that you need to come. Yeah. So... Um... Moving on from there, I'm just trying to get my slideshow to move. It seems to have gone off to sleep a little bit. Um, and, and this question was for uh, Dr. Chinmay Rath. Uh, further management, including the therapeutic options we just touched upon. Yes, uh, like uh, Dr. Ravin also mentioned, uh, doing psychosynthesis or psychoamniotic shunting is not in vogue nowadays because we know that after the Pluto trial, it is not really uh, helping in reducing the morbidity. We may be improving in terms of the survival because lung hypoplasia can be circumvented, but the actual damage to the kidney stays and therefore that needs to be addressed thereafter any which way. The fetoscopic, um, fetoscopic cystoscopy is again something which is being tried and uh, there are some centers who have good experience and are reporting good outcomes, but we'll have to wait and see how that comes across because there are lots of things, sir. I mean, um, the fetal urethra is a very, very delicate organ and uh, the damage to that at that point may not be clear. It may be clear many years after life. And uh, we'll have to wait and see the long-term results of these problems. So although urinary interventions seem to receive a lot of attention in the last 15 years, we've really matured in our approach in the last two years and say, okay, the only real answer is an endoscopic thing, but it requires so much skill and associated with uh, not enough long-term data. So we really have to be careful about that. Now, the patient terminated this pregnancy. She oh. didn't want to uh, carry on. And um, now, of course, it's uh, legal as well, uh, provided she takes permission from the medical board appointed by the state. Um, uh, how should one evaluate the placenta and abortus, Dr. Ratnapuri? Okay, so you should do a fetal autopsy because there could be some malformations which are possibly not identified antenatally because of the oligohydramnios, because that's your fluid of, uh, I mean, that's your medium of seeing the baby. So it's very, very relevant. Very often we say, okay, nothing can be done. So why should we do it? Because you need to counsel that family for subsequent pregnancies. And you can only counsel when you have a definite and you're very sure that there was just an isolated hydrourethronephrosis and uh, you know the face does not look like Down syndrome. And uh, I would do a low resolution scan. You can take a fetal sample from the fetal skin if you want to take it from the fetal surface of the placenta, you would need to do, um, you know, the maternal cell contamination. So we usually save a little bit of money. Everything is about money. And we just take a skin sample and it works very well because you get lots of DNA. And because you're testing the baby directly, as long as you haven't put the fetus in formalin, okay? So when you deliver, you collect these samples you can even keep it in normal saline if you don't have the specific genetic medium. And, um, but if in your center you're doing procedures, you would always have the transport medium in which you collect your chorionic villus sample. So that works very well. You do an external examination, an internal examination. You would look at all the organ systems. You would get a histopathology done for them, take an X-ray. And if you're sure it's an isolated 
posterior urethral valve with no anomalies, with normal chromosomes, we know that the risk of recurrence is very small and you can counsel the families and so they are not agitated and worried about subsequent outcomes. Thank you. Um, we move on to our second last scenario. And the last scenario, of course, is a very interesting one, which will only take a minute. So about 10 minutes we still have for this one. Um, this is an IVF conception, first conception, 11 to 14 week scan, urinary bladder, 14.6 millimeters um, height and uh, kidneys uh, normal. So the question then arises, uh, what uh, do we do and what does this finding imply? Uh, Dr. Chidmay and Rath, please. Uh, um, 14.6 longitudinal diameter of the urinary bladder in the first trimester is increased. Less than seven millimeter is considered to be within normal limits, but more than seven millimeter is increased. Now, um, according to the FFI first trimester data, they say that if it's more than 15 millimeter, then we would think more in terms of lower urinary tract obstruction setting in there. But when it is between seven to 15, we have to uh, consider the possibility of dilatation because of hypotonia as a result of aneuploidies as well. So that will be the overlapping uh, group where we could have either progressive lower urinary tract obstruction or uh, an aneuploid fetus. And therefore we'd look at all other features of aneuploidy and if they are all normal, uh, look at the combined screening test results and follow this uh, baby uh, subsequently at, at 16 weeks, perhaps. Yeah. Well, this is being an IVF pregnancy. Um, she was really, really anxious. Now, the, the question that arose was that in this report that we have, Dr. Vimalsani, what would be the checklist of associated findings that would include at 11 to 14 weeks? Well, oh, so. Uh, as Chinmay pointed out, of the the height of the bladder or the longitudinal length of the bladder that is uh, there, then uh, the renal status, the how are the kidneys? Whether we, are we seeing any obstruction at that stage? So first and foremost, if you see, I think the most catchy thing that you get when you are looking at the 11 to 14 week scan is a distended bladder. So because uh, uh, because otherwise, normally we have to really hunt for the bladder, sir. Uh, especially transabdominally when you're doing, we actually have to hunt for the bladder just to document that the bladder is seen. So if you're seeing the bladder itself, then, uh, you know, that is the first thing that catches you. And uh, once you have, uh, you now you know that you are already, this is more than seven million in terms of it. So uh, automatically, uh, Chinmay has already said the etiology comes into your mind that yes, it can be associated with aneuploidy. So now once we say what once it's 18, 21 and 13, and now, so we know which are the common associations associated. Of course, your uh, protocols won't change, but 100% you need to shift to transvaginal. There is no second thought about it. Once you have seen a megacystis, you need to get into transvaginal. Look into the fetal cranium, intracranial contents very nicely because there, uh, you know, uh, you can have features of trisomy 13, 18 seen in the brain. You try to do a good evaluation of the fetal heart again very important look at the renal systems look for any other associated thing and as you pointed out in the last slide in the last case and that is the umbilical cord cyst very important thing sir because again this 15 millimeter cutoff recent studies are showing uh, really do not matter much sir as far as aneuploidy or no aneuploidy is concerned there is a significant incidence of trisomy 18 and uh, 21 with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bladder length greater than 15 millimeter also. Now, what is why, what is important is like the prognosis will also depend upon are we dealing with a posterior urethral valve or are we dealing with a urethral atresia. The presence of megacystis with umbilical cord cyst has a strong association with urethral atresia. And urethral atresia is definitely very poor prognosis. So, and for all those who, you know, must be thinking uh, about, uh, because uh, embryologically, the allantois connects the bladder with the umbilical cord. And it's between six to 12 weeks, it gets obliterated. Now, if there is a significant bladder distension, this 
obliteration may not takes place and that is why you may get a dilated allantois or you may get a cystic dilatation seen in the umbilical cord hence again transvaginal becomes important because we want to look at the complete as much as possible the complete cord to look for any umbilical cord cyst there wonderful and <clears throat> moving on to our next question uh, genetics please dr ratnapuri so it's already been alluded to that here we have uh, chromosomal disorders as a major cause and in this one situation in addition to the common aneuploidies of 18 13 21 actually it should be in the other order 21 18 and 13 we also have copy number variations so you will have deletions and duplications uh, 22q is also known to present in this situation and also in chromosome 7 in the long arm 7q because there we have an important gene that is associated with the development of the bladder so you would do a copy number variation and um, there are also some single gene disorders that can be associated but i think it's fair enough that we do a, a microarray and because if that is normal in some situations it does not progress to actually this is at a cusp no it's at a border line if it was slightly less the chromosomes are normal the prognosis is good so i think i would do that definitely a, a chromosomal microarray for a megacystis so um ivf ivf and ivf she says no testing you can't touch this baby i'm told there's a miscarriage rate and we told her look there isn't Uh, would you like to know more? We couldn't convince her. And uh, follow-up options, please. Well, now uh, once the patient has refused for any chromosomal evaluation, and uh, not only that, it is almost a borderline that is fourteen point six. Anything uh, less than fifteen, we definitely need to worry about the chromosomal abnormalities. But uh, this is almost at the borderline. and the patient has refused for any invasive testing so basically we are left with uh, uh, other nothing other than uh, following them up ideally it is uh, advisable to follow them up uh, in in about 2 uh, to 4 weeks of uh, intervals and uh, basically the points which we are going to look for is the uh, the size of the kidney echogenicity of the kidney uh, dilatation of the renal pelvis as well as the calices and uh, the dilatation of the urinary bladder as well as the amount of amniotic fluid it is the same sequence that we are going to follow while evaluating the urinary tract and uh, it is the same thing that we are going to follow in this particular patient also because it's only a borderline we definitely have that the possibility of a luto that is the lower urinary tract obstruction in our definite mind definitely in mind and then as uh, bimal has suggested i mean uh, identifying a umbilical cord cyst would have helped us in uh, uh, probably thinking more in favor of an aneuploidy rather than if you don't find them as it has not been specified here so obviously we know that we are going to deal with uh, probably a lower urinary tract obstruction so the follow up is the best and 2 to 4 week interval follow up is what is uh, advised and the features that we are going to look for are the dysplastic changes in the kidney amount of amniotic fluid women do your patients more frequently terminate the, these pregnancies or do they actually think of carrying on quite a few sir the 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 termination is more common sir so a lot of people are so scared that unless it's a really really precious pregnancy they will not investigate they will really do nothing and that is one of the tragedies that we have to try and correct in our part of the world uh, well this patient went on um, she was uneventful 16 weeks yeah. care in that case we could offer if she's refused and we document that she is refused um, invasive testing and we know yeah. that predominantly commonly we are looking at 21 and 18 you could offer her a nipt yes but so, after documentation because a third person may think oh she's offered an nipt for a mal and uh, so um, uh, she was not open to any investigation Uh, then she came in for an 18 week scan and the right renal pelvis was 3.2 mm uh, no um, sorry this is the next case and so she came in for that and at that time the bladder had reached up to the neck and um, then there was really no choice and then she terminated the pregnancy and it turned out to be a trisomy 21 and uh, that that time of course we did a full investigation and now for the last few minutes and i know 
I've forgotten to ask my colleagues at the back office to actually put in our, uh, uh, our uh, trade partnership videos, but let's get on to this last report, which I want everybody to comment upon. There's a patient who comes in at a routine and normally scan at 18 weeks. And the report comes in says right renal pelvis, AP diameter 3.2 millimeters, left 2.9 millimeters, advised triple test and clinical correlation. Does anybody of us like this report? Is any one of us embarrassed by this report? <laughs> we all of us. All of us. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it reflects our complete inability to have reached out correctly to the first step in, in, in fetal medicine, which is uh, beyond clinical evaluation of the actual imaging. I, I think in our day-to-day -day practice, we do see this sort of things in more than 60% of the cases. Yes. Sir, this is still a better report because they have said right renal pelvis is this and left is this. But most of the times we find that in the, say, the substance of the report, it is given right renal pelvis 3.2, left 2.9, and the impression is mild bilateral heteronephrosis. Yes. So, see, you're contradicting uh, your own uh, the definition itself. You know, you are calling it as mild hydronephrosis, and at the same time, you're saying it is only 2.9 and 3.2. So, yeah. this is a very common scenario. And that is the reason. One message I would like to give here is that it has to be measured in a transverse section. I think I, every time I see something like this or 4.1, 4.2, and if I look at the image, the measurement has been done in a sagittal section, sir. And that is where we go absolutely wrong. And the most important thing is that, okay, APD is very important. If whatever type of grading classification you use, your basically starting point is the anterior posterior uh, diameter of the renal pelvis. But then it is very, very specific that it should be measured. It should be the intrarenal pelvis and it should be measured in the transverse section of the kidneys. And maybe preferably with the spine anterior, but if that's not possible, even you can still do it with the spine posterior, but not with the, you know, in a sagittal section and all. I think the maximum mistakes come because of that. And if at all you still want to call it as mild hydronephrosis in your report, at least don't mention that it is 2.3, 2.4 millimeter. See, you are contradicting your own self. Uh, sure enough. And, and Dr. Ratnapuri, this triple test business, what, what do we do with our second trimester triple tests? Nothing. Throw it out of the window. Yes. So actually, this was uh, this was the first test which came up after an AFP was done for neural tube defects, and the sensitivity of this test is low. Uh, it's the lowest of all our screening tests when we combine biochemical uh, parameters, even in the second trimester. So. Um, I, I do know that in some institutions, probably in our public institutions, they do advise it because of cost reasons. But I don't think that there is a lot of difference between the cost of a triple test and a quadruple test. You would only do these second trimester markers if you haven't done the first trimester. If you've done the first trimester, please don't do an isolated second trimester. If you want to enhance your screening sensitivity, we would integrate it with the first trimester and use the risk of the first trimester as the a priori risk. I think these are very, very important points because we have n number of patients who come with a 1 in 10,000 risk in the first trimester and a 1 in 150 risk in the triple test or a quadruple test. And it's impossible to make anything out of it. And the patient just spends more money for you know, further testing to confirm that the child doesn't have Down syndrome. Yes. Um, thank you very much. This was the finding five that we wanted to look at. And I'm going to take a few minutes to look at the actual uh, uh, questions that have come into the box. So I would request the panelists to stay on. We're going to spend about 10, 15 minutes on those questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and request uh, back end uh, to share the uh, 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 um, our videos from. So here we are back with uh, a lot of questions and we have about 15 minutes in which to run through those. And our very first question is, um, um, Bimal, you'll have to answer this for us because it's directly related to uh, what, you, what I asked you. Do we need to do karyotype for a patient with a low risk first trimester screen, but at the anomaly scan at 18 to 20 weeks, there is a 
urinary tract dilatation A1 with an echogenic focus in the heart. Okay, now this is becoming, uh, now we are dealing with two soft markers here. It, yes. may, it may be low risk, that's important. Now we need to put, again, recalculate the, uh, you know, what is the combined likelihood ratio of both these markers. So I, you just can't uh, shirk it off that because both of them are like as an isolated finding do not have much significance, but both of them combined together, the likelihood ratio is going to be more. I think it would go to somewhere around six or so uh, with both of them put together, the ecogenic focus as well as this. And hence all that calculation needs to go about or uh, you can just uh, go into your software and uh, put in both the click on that and it will tell you what is the combined likelihood ratio. And then that you utilize in uh, adjusting the risk of what has been calculated in the uh, first trimester. Excellent. So if the combined likelihood ratio is coming to somewhere around six, and if the uh, first trimester screening, uh, 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 the combined screening was one in say uh, 6,000, then there's no problem. It is one in thousand. But if it is, if, if it, it was uh, say one in 1100, then it would become uh, one in uh, 180 or one in 190. So this is how the calculation, and then you follow your routine protocols about it. Wonderful. And there's a question from Dr. Devasmita. Uh, she wants to know if the pediatric urology classification is all about renal parameters related to anatomical alterations, any classification showing all renal pathologies. Yes, of course, and we know that there is one. We have the Dubile classification we use, and that'll be part of another uh, webinar in the future, because that's really topic by itself. And we will also answer, we had some odd questions on renal parenchyma, we'll answer those then. Now, one question from Dr. Prachi Singhal, can we confidently diagnose normal ureteric insertion in the urinary bladder or ectopic insertion of the urinary bladder in cases presenting with a hydroureter? What are the chances of missing this or seeing this on a routine ultrasound scan? Yeah. Um, basically, when you want to really evaluate the insertion of the ureter, uh, the lower end of the ureter is, is quite often very, very difficult. Uh, it's not that easy. Only thing is, in case if you have a duplex system, obviously you know that the upper pole calysis, that is the upper moiety, is usually the one which opens up lower, quite often into the posterior urethra or into the vagina, if it is a female fetus. So that way you can make out, but then in a, in a, a isolated uh, right hydro, I mean, hydronephroureterosis, uh, assessment of the lower urine, urinary, I mean, ureter into the bladder or into the posterior urethra is very, very difficult to make out. True. Um, there's a question from Dr. Arthi Singh. Uh, what is the cutoff for renal parenchymal thickness? Uh, quite often it is, uh, it is considered, it is again a gestation age dependent. Basically, a cutoff is about four millimeters. Anything less than four, six millimeters is, uh, is considered to be a thinning of the renal parenchyma. It is more than the cutoff point. It is the progress of thinning that is much more important than the cutoff thinning. And the, and the classification we've been using this evening also says that, look, it's always subjective. Yes. After all, we do understand that the poles have a thicker parenchyma and the, uh, the lateral aspect of the cortex has a thinner parenchyma. So we really will not attach so much importance. It was only the Onin uh, grading, which actually used the placental thickness per se, as uh, the criteria, yeah, yeah. The, the Onin classification, so the hmm. Onin grading. And, uh, but apart from that, really not very much in terms of the numbers. So we don't really need to indicate that as numbers. There's a very interesting question from uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish Bhavatkar. And he says in hydronephrosis with hydroureter, do we still need to measure renal pelvis AP diameter for sequential follow-up? Mm, yeah, when, when you are doing uh, evaluation of the urinary tract, I think it is better to get all the parameters in, in uh, the yes. data available. And since there is no, even though, yes, when once the ureter is dilated, obviously the renal pelvis also may be dilated, but then it's always better to document because the progress of that dilatation can be reassessed in the third trimester or whenever you are re-evaluating. So it is essential that you need to document it. Yeah. So the, essence is your, the checklist should not change, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. That checklist has to be the same, except later on you add fetal growth and Doppler. Yeah. So Bimal, what, what about measuring the KLSCs? Would you do that? No, sir. Yeah. Again, a subjective assessment. 
But yes, as uh, Praveen sir pointed out, uh, between central and peripheral, that is uh, that differentiation is important, but it is subjective. We won't uh, go about measuring it, sir. Yeah. And then we have a question that um, says that, so in case of LUTO, uh, should we do a microarray in the third trimester or should we just offer postnatal evaluation? And what are the chances of a genetic etiology in case of LUTO in females um, uh, who have, say, urethral atresia? Hardly anything. For urethral atresia, it's really not there. And I think we just, uh, we don't need to do a microarray uh, in the third trimester. It's enough to do an aneuploidy and you offer. There are some families who say nothing. We'll evaluate everything after birth. Some want to know. So it's entirely the decision of the family after you've spent a little time and discussed with them. It's, it's a very low probability. 95% yeah. everything would be okay as far as chromosomes go. Um, we're going to skip some of the questions on echogenic kidneys um, and, and, and focal dysplasia of the kidney because that's going to be part of another program and move on to the questions we still have directly related to the topic today from Anupam Bhala. Isolated umbilical cord cyst in the first trimester is karyotype to be advised. And also, uh, what do we do with an isolated cord cyst in the second trimester? Uh, Dr. Ratnapuri, please. Isolated cord cyst in the first trimester, isolated umbilical cord cyst in the second trimester. I don't think it has any genetic association. Yes. Yeah. So by itself, it doesn't mean much. We just use it as additional evidence when we have something in some other system. Then we have a very interesting uh, question from Dr. Rekha Maratha, and she wants to know, uh, can the renal pelvis be measured in a first trimester scan? Mm, no, actually the normograms that have been designed are designed from 16 weeks onwards. Uh, the multidisciplinary uh, uh, consensus statement that has been published is from 16 weeks onwards, not before that. But yes, yes, whenever we have a, a, a renal pelvis which is dilated, even in the first trimester, with a dilated bladder, definitely you need to uh, take the measurement and uh, use it as a data in, in future examination. It's more of a subjective this thing, but uh, in the first trimester, 2.5 millimeter is... Uh, you know, for your own benefit, I mean, I won't say that it is as per any guidelines, but anything more than 2.5 millimeter in the first trimester is something which uh, uh, warrants, uh, at least, you know, you can always jot down on paper also that there is a minimally dilated uh, pelvic system there sir, or pelvis there. Sir. Dr. Chinmay, what would you I would differ here, sir. I would beg to differ because in first trimester, the only thing that we have been told to see is the bladder and its uh, variations with some objective measurements. As far as the kidneys are concerned, we are mostly just looking at it subjectively. I agree that in cases of severe, um, uh, like megacystis, we do see changes in the kidneys and we look at it, look, it's looking ecogenic, it's looking prominent. So I think it will suffice to just be subjective about the kidneys because we can do more harm by setting these kind of, uh, it's very difficult to get them in the transverse section in the A be, uh, diameter at the right plane with the baby moving so much in the first trimester. The yeah. other thing we have to remember is the kidneys may not have the pelvis may not be that uh, functional in the first trimester as compared to 16 weeks and that is perhaps why the nomograms have started to be made from 16 weeks. So instead of stretching our imagination and skills to things which are not going to give us clinical benefit, I think uh, for the because Bimal sir might be able to uh, measure it but for the rest of us I think we should just leave it. No, no, no. I am just I'm just saying, no, no, I get what you're saying this thing, ki, that uh, I'm, I, that's what I said. You can't document Absolutely. and say that this is 2.7 millimeter, hence it is prominent. It is just uh, out of uh, practical experience. I'm just saying that true, true. roughly around that, but it is a subjective decision. Definitely, it's a subjective thing. Also, our routine view for actually looking at the kidneys at the 11 to 14 weeks is a longitudinal scan through both kidneys yes. at the anterior level in the, in the abdomen uh, rather than our standard cross sectional view. And uh, so it's really not something. And therefore, uh, as an answer to Dr. Anupambala's question on whether there's a cutoff for epidemic in the first trimester, we already have that answered. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uzma Sheikh asking a question on why a karyotype is not done after 24 weeks. So in the laboratory, if you've ever seen how they, they do a karyotype, they have to grow the fetal cells. Any cell has to be grown. 
because you catch the karyotype when the cells are dividing. That's the time when they are longest. Otherwise, they're very small and you cannot see them. So when you take a prenatal sample, you put it in a flask and the fetal cells really settle to the bottom and attach to the surface. After 24 weeks, they don't attach to the surface because of the maturity of the cells. And that's why, because they don't attach to the surface of the flask, they don't, they don't grow and they don't multiply and you can't do a karyotype. I mean, you can, you can try, one odd will take off, but most of them fail. Yes. And Dr. Osman Sheikh also has a related question. And she wants to know what Whatever happened to prenatal bobs and why have we shifted to CMA? You know, um, there used to be a company that used to offer prenatal bobs. It came and then they lost interest and it came back again. And now it's on the back burner again. Yes. So prenatal bobs is very targeted. You know, it's, it's a very targeted lot of micro deletions and duplications. I don't have any personal experience. I've really never used it. And what I'm saying is what I've read and understood about it. Uh, so it probably gives you limited information. And uh, because we are identifying new things all the time, you know, it's okay. If you just want to look at 22Q micro deletion, you can do a prenatal bobs. But when you want to, um, query the entire genome and you want to look at deletions, duplications there, then that will not suffice. Yes. And so it's, it's not really um, sold even by the original company anymore. Um, we then have a question on ureteric measurements and Shali Sharma wants to know, in case of a hydroureteronephrosis down to the visico-ureteric junction, at how many places should we measure the ureter size for follow-up? <laughs> I think that's a very tricky question. And I think I would prefer to take at the maximum diameter. At any maximum diameter, at whatever stage of peristalsis, and we often see peristalsis. So, so Bimal, would you agree with me on that? One single reading yeah, yeah, yeah. maximum. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I and, won't go about measuring it. Uh, yes, and in case it was bilateral, I would do one measurement for the right and one for the left. But I would spend some time sitting and looking and making sure how much, whether only in the pelvis and so on. It will change after some time. Yes. It does. It does. Yes, it does. And um, then there is this great closing question. Uh, Jinmay, before I, everybody thinks that I always ask Bimal the same questions, please tell me that if I have an echogenic intracardiac focus with a pilectasis, should I do a karyotype just on the basis of two markers or should I do a nice full calculation? We have to do a nice full calculation, sir. And whether after that calculation, a karyotype is needed or not needed is the decision of the patient. If they still want to know the karyotype, I'll do it, whatever the calculation. If they want to leave it on us, then we should do a calculation. If you've done a first trimester, so we are always coming back to that point that whether you've done your first trimester screening well or not. Because we are, why are we hesitating in doing the karyotype here? Because both echogenic focus as well as uh, mild pelvic thesis, we know are minor markers. All of us know that most of these cases, even if we do a karyotype, we are more likely to get a normal result. The only reason it will be done is to uh, alleviate the anxiety, which has been an iatrogenic creation. But if we have done a first trimester screening normally, then by the time we have reached here, our denominator will be some 6,000 or 7,000. And so even if we multiply it by six or seven, it's going to be in the low risk range. So I think doing our first trimester screening well, doing the correct things in the first trimester, rather than very fancy things, will help us much more in our practice. There is one basic question, sir, I think uh, you've seen that, that how to measure the um, anterior posterior diameter um, of the kidney. I think we can Some demonstrate it. Demonstration. Yes. Well, you know, the, the good news is that we are, we've managed to get PNDT clearance uh, for live demonstrations. And we hope that in the next few months, Some we'll be able to put together. That. But it's in the transfer uh, section of uh, the live note. demonstrations. And because there is now a policy in place, yes, with the spine anterior, as Dr. Bimal Sani said. And uh, so we will be able to handle that. Um, uh, Dr. Ratnapuri, uh, coming back to that question that we just asked from Chinmay, uh, would you agree that we just shouldn't go by two markers in case we have a full workup? Of course, if we didn't have anything, uh, then uh, we would definitely need uh, 
to go by this it also depends on how much the patient has been scared so mm-hmm. sometimes they come with horror stories that they have been asked to discontinue the pregnancy etc 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 so i think we have to be very careful of what we casually tell you know the families when some anything is identified on an ultrasound scan because you tell them a little they magnify it in their head and then it's very impossible to you know get things out of their head so all in all i think it's the final decision of the family but you have to guide them correctly based on all the calculations madam i i'll ask you one question suppose fts has not been done at all now you finding a, a single soft marker why forget to but then would you like to do a quadruple and then modify take that as a baseline or uh, just uh... okay so you know if you read the the latest guidelines they say you you offer it, it's on a platter we've discussed this before yeah. if the patient says i want a cvs and i want a chromosomal microarray there's nothing incorrect in that okay so it's not for me to decide whether i would do a quadruple but if i have to do a screening test and there is something that's come on the ultrasound i would even offer them an nipt it's a brilliant test all i have against it is the cost of the test and the fact that they feel you know i'm telling you i see i see children with genetic disorders and the first thing that mother tells me doctor saab mera to ye bhi test hua tha mera to ultrasound mein kuch nahi pakda gaya tha they think that that it's a genetic test and we look at 20000 genes in that genetic test and i think it's very important that while we offer them so much for down syndrome we uh, we make sure that they know it's only done for one thing so i think we are doing too much focus on the fact that this is looking they, they, you know what they are told they are told ke isme se to guarantee ho jayegi ki aapka bachcha mand buddhi nahi hoga so it's it's horrendous what kind of stories we hear related to this uh, probably that's a way of explaining I, i i think it was a incorrect statement to say that it was incorrect of what we hear that's the per- patient's perception but um, i think we can offer it to them with the correct insight that we are looking at one thing and it doesn't evaluate for everything and we have that baseline 2% risk and 98% everything will become okay and i think it's it's nice to be positive and again we need this counseling even prior to an anomaly scan we have to counsel and the fact that we are again looking at markers the fact that we have already had the screening test but we are looking at markers so at the time of the first trimester screening post test counseling we give that prelude that when you come for the next scan we will be looking at things that so some of these things will surface as markers we will reassess this uh, screening process at that point and then so they are mentally prepared and when you find a problem you can always tell them that now the risk has got revised it is whatever it is and then they take a decision wonderful um we have uh, had a fantastic interaction and my thanks to the panel for this and uh, thank you so much for all those questions we uh, promise to take uh, similar sessions in the future to answer some more readers queries and uh, back to our host the riper obs and gaini society uh, for 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 the thanksgiving etc thank you very much sir uh, so on behalf of society of fetal medicine and uh, riper obstetrics and gynecological society uh, today on this web series uh, of fetal urinary dilatation in ultrasound uh, reporting i would like to thank the man behind this web series uh, i would like to say the hero of this web series dr ashok khurana sir uh, i would also like to thank all our esteemed panelists today dr tln praveen sir uh, dr ratnapuri madam dr bimal sahani sir and uh, dr chinmay rath madam it's always uh, been a pleasure to learn from great teachers like you all thank you very much and uh, i would also like to thank our president uh, a woman of fighter spirit uh dr asha jan madam uh, who i am sure is going to uh, beat the covid and uh, come back stronger uh, we all wish you a speedy recovery ma'am and uh, my uh, sincere thanks to our trade partners uh, ge and lifecell and uh, thank you very much everyone 
and i would also like to thank uh, ashok khurana sir for that uh, mtp act which has been passed thank you so much sir thank you indi thank you thanks everyone thanks all the participants bye bye thank you very much bye thank you good, 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 night. Thank you. good, good night. night thank you vishal thank you bye good night sir bye bye sir thank you